So my name is Wesley, uh, this is Iban, uh, like we were just introduced, and uh, welcome to our talk on how we made our availability metrics more meaningful with eBPF. So who are we? Um, yeah, I'm Wesley, I'm a software developer at SAP. Um, there's my GitHub as well, my email in case there's any questions or if you'd like to uh, follow me on GitHub. And I'm currently working on an open source project called Gardner, where we provide Kubernetes clusters as a service. Uh, we use it at the company, but it's also open source if anyone uh, wants to try it. And we'll be talking about it a little bit more in detail in the presentation. Hi, I'm Alban. Uh, I'm a principal software engineer at Microsoft. I used to be at uh, Kinfog before, and I'm working uh, mostly on a project called Inspector Gadget, and is doing um, eBPF and Kubernetes work. Okay, so we'll get right into it. Um, so we have availability metrics in the title. Uh, this week is the KubeCon, so not surprisingly, we'll be measuring the uptime of Kubernetes clusters. And these clusters are created in the context of Gardner. So we, we created this project or um, yeah, we, we started this work um, because Gardner creates Kubernetes clusters. This uh, Kubernetes as a service. We use it internally at SAP, so internal departments will come to us. We provide an API for them and can provision Kubernetes clusters for them. Uh, so they can say they would like a cluster from AWS or Azure or GCP, and we provide uh, just normal vanilla Kubernetes clusters for them. And what we want to do is we would like to measure the API server uptime of these clusters, uh, just to, to, to measure how, uh, how uh, good our service is. And what we want to do in this talk is we want to improve these metrics and make them more meaningful. And one, one way to do that is, or, or one important thing to inf uh, define first is SLAs or service level agreements. Maybe most of you have already heard about what this is, um, but just in case, um, uh, we have like a, I have a screenshot here of this uptime.is and you can enter in a uh, like a target SLA. So like for example, 99.95%, that means uh, the service provider and the, the people using the, the service. So in our case at SAP, it would be Gardner and the internal, Gardner would be the service provider providing Kubernetes clusters and the client would be the, uh, the internal departments consuming the Kubernetes clusters. And if we promise, for example, uh, 99.95% uptime, that means our clusters should be up that amount of time. And then there's also this concept of error budgets, which means um, basically just defines how much downtime are you allowed to have and still uphold your SLA, so still uh, maintain your agreement. And then there's, uh, there's like different periods where you can define that. So for example, if you want to maintain this SLA for a day, um, hopefully you can see it here. It says uh, it has like the, the daily, uh, that's like 43 seconds. That's not a lot of time. And we'll come back again a little bit later. And then uh, you have a different period as well, like weekly, monthly, like the monthly, for example, is uh, almost 22 minutes that you have um, available as potential downtime. Um, so where does this name Meaningful come from? Uh, so this uh, project was inspired by a paper from Google called Meaningful Availability. And I don't want to get too much into the details of the paper, but uh, essentially what, uh, what, they, what their aim was, was to provide metrics that were more meaningful um, in the sense that it re the, the metrics really represent what the user experiences. Because you could have, for example, like some uh, synthetic metrics that uh, measure the uptime of your service, but does it really capture what the user experiences? And this is something that we wanted to, to do for our service as well. Okay, so I'll start maybe with uh, something that wasn't working for us or uh, that is uh, maybe less meaningful in a sense, and that would be uh, probing the API server at specific intervals. So this is a pretty pretty simple way to measure uptime, and this can lead to some problems. So um, if you probe the uh, API server once per minute, uh, maybe it says that it's up all the time, but in between the minutes that you're probing, you have a bunch of downtime, but you don't really know because you're probing it and uh, you don't really know what's happening in between there. Uh, so in essence, this isn't really representative of what the client experiences and we would like something better. And also, if you remember, we had, uh, so for the 99.95%, you have 43 seconds of downtime per day. Um, and if you want that fine granular metric, you have to probe your API server once per second. At that point, you're basically DDoSing your API server. Okay, it should be able to handle the load, but um, you're just adding unnecessary load to just get these uh, one second granular metrics. 
Um, and also, it could also be that the API server is up, but for some reason the connection failed and you don't really know why. Um, so what did we do to create meaningful metrics? Um, yeah, so how did Google do it in their paper? What they did is they processed access logs. So like if there was a, a 500 um, HTTP code and it's a failed, uh, a failed connection versus like a 200 code, then they could process it as a successful connection. And then they put these metrics into, a, into time buckets. So they annotated time and said, okay, one second is successful or not successful based on if there was a failed connection or not successful connection. Um, we can't do this so easily in the Gardner architecture. So, um, like I said, this project is uh, made in the context of Gardner, and uh, we can't necessarily process the, uh, the access logs. Um, okay, we could process the ones from the API server, but uh, then, then we raise the question, what do we do or how do we evaluate it whenever the API server is down? And uh, that's kind of difficult. We also have a reverse proxy that proxies to our different API servers, um, but there the um, the connections are all encrypted, so we can't process those either. Um, so we had to do a different approach. Okay, we could change the architecture, but we wanted to explore some possibilities with eBPF. What could we do? And that's what I'm going to, uh, to talk about. Um, but first, we should get into the Gardner architecture a little bit so that everyone's on the same page. Um, so in Gardner, we have this concept of shoot clusters. That's these ones right here. This is what the, the client, so the user of the service gets. They just get a normal vanilla Kubernetes cluster, which has a workload. You can run some pods there. It's a normal Kubernetes cluster, um, except for one thing, and that's the control plane is hosted on a separate cluster. That's what we call a seed cluster. That's over here. And then uh, hopefully you can see the different colors. I color coded the, uh, the shoot clusters, and they all get their own corresponding control plane. Where the API server runs, okay, there's also a few other pods, but for this presentation, the only thing we care about is the uh, is the API server. And we also have a component there, the Envoy, uh, which acts as a reverse proxy to, to um, send the, uh, the connections to the uh, correct API servers. Um, and it does this using, uh, using something called SNI, or server name indication, which is important a little bit later on. Um, and the SNI is basically just the, the, the host name of the API server. Or it contains, so for example, it would just be like blue, red, or green, and it's uh, an unencrypted thing that we can process. And it kind of looks like this. So the Envoy is able to uh, distinguish based or distinguish the connections based on the SNIs. So for example, you might do like a, a kubectl get pods. And then uh, the first thing you have to do is you have to do the, uh, the create a TCP connection. So you send the SYN, get the SYN ACK. It's quite normal. Then you establish a TLS connection. And what the uh, client has to do is the client has to send a client hello. And this client hello contains the SNI. So for example, if the blue cluster is doing this, then the SNI would say blue.cluster or whatever the host name of the API server is. And then Envoy can process this and route it to the correct API server. The server then responds with the server hello. We've established a TLS connection, and then we can just have our HTTP traffic as normal, um, which is encrypted. Um, and from Wikipedia, in case you're interested, this is the, uh, the definition from Wikipedia. Um, so we'll go over this network path once again. Uh, this little tiny orange blob here is a, is a client hello. We'll follow the path of the client hello in this, uh, in this architecture. Um, so a pod is perhaps doing a kubectl get pods or wat you know, watching pods, for example. And uh, so what happens is it, uh, it goes to the seed cluster. So we have a, singular, uh, a single load balancer on the seed cluster. Um, we used to have multiple for each API server, but we, uh, we introduced a a cost saving measure to only have a single load balancer so we don't have to have a load balancer for every API server. Um, so then it lands on a random node and then uh, there's Kubernetes networking happens and it lands on this envoy. And this envoy does the routing based on the SNI. Okay, this came from the blue cluster so we route it to the blue cluster, cluster's API server. This is how, it, how the, uh, the architecture works whenever everything is healthy. And then if it's unhealthy, the same thing happens. The client hello ends up on the, uh, on the Envoy, um, but it can't send it to the API server. So then we get a, a TCP reset packet, and this is sent back the same way that it came. So it goes on to the, to the random node where it was, and then it ends back by the client, and the client knows, okay, my connection failed. And this would be a failed connection in our case. 
And then where the magic comes in is we have a component running on every single node cluster, which is this red diamond here. And we, uh, so we deploy a daemon set in our seed clusters and we can, um, and we can process these connections. So we can evaluate if, um, if the connection was failed or, um, or successful based on if an RST packet came or if, it, if one didn't come. And then we can expose some Prometheus metrics and process this data. So for example, the Prometheus data could look something like this. Um, we just expose a, a counter metric for those of you that uh, are familiar with Prometheus. So it always just increments and we say how many, success, uh, how many seconds were successful, how many seconds were failed. So those are the first two metrics. Um, hopefully it, the text is big enough, but here we have the kind active and we also know which SNI it belongs to. So we could do this mapping to which cluster it belongs to as well. And we just increment the seconds. And um, yeah, then we have this active failed, which is, means there was a connection. There actually was a connection and it failed, which means this RST packet came. And then finally we have this uh, just normal failed, which means the last second that we know about was a failed connection and there hasn't been any traffic since. Yeah. Then we scrape this data with Prometheus, perform some uh, PromQL queries on it. And then we can finally visualize the data in our, um, on, uh, on a Grafana dashboard. And uh, we have some, uh, some fixed time windows. So that means from, from Monday to Monday, ex for example, or um, every hour, we just reset these counters and we can, uh, we can start measuring the, the SLA again from there. And now I would like to, uh, to move to a demo to actually demo this. Um. Oh. Okay, so I have a few terminals here. Let's just reset them. Um, so on the right side, I will start a watch on, uh, so this is, this is one of the control planes that we have of a cluster. So I've created a, a demo cluster here. Hopefully this all, all works. Okay, there's quite a few pods. The only one that we care about is this, uh, is this cube API server. So this is the one where we're measuring the uptime and I will, uh, I will restart. So I will kill this pod. It will get restarted because it's a deployment. And then hopefully I will be able to, to show you the Grafana dashboard and see that there was actually a downtime. So I delete the API server. Hopefully we see that it restarts. Yep, you see it's restarting. Perfect. Yeah. Mm. Okay, maybe maybe I will just uh, open up the entire terminal then when I show the show the next things. But yeah, it's terminating here. Hopefully you can see that I deleted the pod. Um, then here we can. Then I just want to show off the, the daemon set. So we have a bunch of uh, pods running in a separate namespace. This is just the daemon set. And if we do a, a K top pod, we can also see that um, they're hardly using any resources. So they're using like one, uh, one milli core and barely any memory as well. So it's quite efficient. Um, and then finally we have a, um, we have some monitoring as well. Uh, just the, the cube Prometheus stack. So it's just a Prometheus and a Grafana. And I will port forward to the Grafana and showcase the dashboard and hopefully we can see this downtime. Um, so first of all, I'll make this a little bit bigger. Um, so here we can select the period. So if we want to know the, the, um, the SLA for the week or for the calendar month or for the, for the day or whatever. Um, so here we have the week selected and we can see all the SNIs that we're tracking, how many are within our air budget and how many are exceeding it. Um, can filter it as well up here. And then we can go to the demo cluster that I just, uh, where I just restarted the API server. We should, okay, because I changed the resolution, we don't see the, um, don't see the percentage. Yeah, you should also see the uh, the uptime percentage here, but because I changed the resolution, you can't see that. But yeah, we can also drill down to this as well and then get a more, uh, a close, a better, a better overview of everything as well. And then for example, for the, uh, for the hourly SLAs, we can see, okay, something happened here. There was a downtime and we can see how many downtime seconds there actually were. So there were, okay, restarting the API server caused four seconds of downtime. So we can really measure it down to the second granularity because we're capturing these, uh, these packets with eBPF. Um, and then also, again, we have the same view as uh, in an SLA form as well. And we can see, okay, now we have uh, exceeded our error. Yeah, 
Okay, I've restarted it earlier as well a few times. Uh, so now for the, for the hour, we've exceeded our, uh, our budget, for example. Okay, and then we have the, the same views for the days, the week, and the calendar month as well. Uh, the cluster hasn't been running, uh, it's not the entire, it's, the cluster hasn't been running for a month yet, which is why we don't see the, the data for the entire month. Um, yeah, that's everything for the demo. And I think for the next part, Iban will explain in a little bit more in technical detail how we, uh, how we did all of this with eBPF. We will continue. Can you hear me fine? Cool. Um, so to be able to do that, we need to be uh, to look at the packets and distinguish which connections are successful or failed. Uh, in this example, we look, for example, on the right, there is a TCP reset packet, and we consider that a failed connection. On the left, a successful connection. And how do we do that with the BPF? Uh, first, what is a BPF? It's a like a small program that runs inside the Linux kernel. There are different kind of eBPF programs uh, about networking, about tracing, about security. In this case, in this presentation, we only care about networking. Uh, so it looks like that is a C function that it will be executed for every single packet that comes on the network. And the parameter of that function is a network packet. And inside that function, we will be able to look at the content of the packet. Uh, like in this example, we can see if it is a TCP packet, IP packet, and so on. Um, how do we install an uh, eBPF program in a Linux kernel? Uh, first, we have an agent, which is a user space program here written in Go. Um, it will install the BPF program in the kernel using the BPF system call. It will install uh, maps as well. I will come to that. And then, uh, once it's installed, every time there is a packet on the network, it will execute uh, a, new, uh, a new instance of the BPF program. It will execute it uh, again and again. And the BPF program will be able to update uh, eBPF maps. So eBPF maps are like a global variable on the system. Uh, they can be of different type, hash table, array, and so on. And those uh, variables can be read from user space as well. So our agent program written in Go will be able to read the BPF map and uh, from that uh, update Prometheus metrics and so on. Um, so to distinguish a successful connection and failed connection, I mentioned uh, looking inside the packet to see if uh, there is a TCP RCT packet, for example. Um, so that's one side. And the other side is uh, we can uh, categorize connections after a timeout. If nothing happened for the connection for a while, um, if, for example, we only see the TCP SYN packet and then nothing else for more than 20 seconds, in this project we consider that's a failed connection. Or if, we, uh, if it is an established connection, we have seen the SNA packet and there is traffic going on after 20 seconds, we don't, moni we don't need to monitor it anymore. We consider it's a successful connection. That was our criteria in this project. And then once we categorize connection, we can uh, annotate the timeline. Uh, we have a time bucket here. Every second, we um, annotate it either successful second or failed second. So when there is, uh, when all the connections on that second are successful in green, the second is successful. Otherwise, it's in red, it's failed. And some seconds, there are no connections. So in this case, uh, we call it an inactive second, and we just carry on the state from the previous second, um, like in this example here. Um, this. Um, a program has uh, two eBPF maps, this kind of uh, global variable I mentioned before. One is called the connections map. Uh, we keep track of uh, the connections. Uh, that's necessary because BPF programs by themselves, they don't have any state. Uh, so we need to keep the states about connection in a BPF map. And we keep, uh, it's a hash table, we keep the tuple of the connection and we keep some statistics about that, whether we have seen the SNI uh, packet or not, and uh, the timestamp and so on. And from that, we can uh, look if the um, connection has been going on for more than 20 seconds, we are able to categorize it. Another map we have is the statistics. Uh, BPF, in this case, uh, keeps track of uh, the last 20 seconds on a for each uh, slot. We uh, keep a hash table for each SNI, whether um, there was a successful connection or failed connections. And then uh, the um, program will be, the Golang program will be able to look at those maps and uh, update the metrics. 
Uh, I will not go into that, but that's just to show you the flow of um, um, a BPF. Sorry, the flow of the execution of the eBPF program for one packet. It will look at uh, inside the packet if it is a TCP scene and so on, and then update the maps. And uh, similarly, the user space program in Go will um, look at the maps every second and update the uh, Prometheus metrics. Um, so this project, Connectivity Exporter, can be uh, installed either on the shoot cluster or on the seed cluster, as uh, Wesley explained before. Um, both uh, cases are pro and cons, uh, depending on what you want to do. Um, if you install it on the shoot clusters, you might you will be able to notice more uh, error case. Uh, for example, if there is a network uh, failure between the two clusters, um, you are not going to notice that if the component monitoring is, is on the server side. Uh, so you can catch more things. Um, but it has advantage to install it on the seed cluster as well, like uh, Gardena does, uh, because we are going to notice anyway when the API server is done, when the pod has shut down, you are going to notice that. And you can uh, also see which of the um, node, worker node on the seed uh, cluster has a problem. Uh, if it is installed here, you cannot see that. Um, so we are able to have a granularity of one second to, to know how many seconds are uh, okay or not. Um, how does it work? Because Prometheus is not scrapping uh, the, the, the endpoints every second. That would be too much traffic. Uh, typically, Prometheus scraps the uh, endpoint every minute. Um, but what we export is actually a counter of seconds successful or fail. And in Prometheus, the counters are always increasing. So we don't lose uh, the previous second we can keep the granularity of um, one second. And then uh, Prometheus scrap diff the different worker nodes and uh, by looking at the different results, it's able to infer how many seconds are okay or not. This is an example of a uh, SNA packet with a wire shark. Uh, this is just to show you that uh, inside the packet, you have the IP, TCP, and uh, TLS content. And the SNI uh, name indication extension. It's uh, here, and it's, uh, you can see the name in clear text. And that's what the ABPF program is doing. It's just uh, uh, looking at this packet, and here you can see the C code that uh, look at, uh, for example, uh, the encryption method, and so on, and then it go to each field to find the correct uh, field we care about, the SNI packet. Um, so this project has been developed uh, um, for Gardener initially, but that's an open source project. It's not specific to Gardener. It can work on other Kubernetes distributions. And um, so um, Wesley uh, has tested it on Gardener. It works, of course. I've tested it on um, AKS. It works there as well. And um, you can also uh, test it if you control the control plane. The, cluster that contain your API servers, you can try it there as well. Um, it works on gardeners, and I'm exploring the possibility to use that uh, on AKS as well. And for this project, we have written an eBPF program that uh, pass the SNI packet. Um, this can be used for other projects, and this is an example of Inspector Gadget. Um, it's an open source project I'm working on to uh, inspect what's happening on the Kubernetes cluster. And we reuse the eBPF program to, uh, to be able to trace that. So in this example, at the bottom, we have a simple wget uh, command to connect to some server, to Wikipedia. And then uh, here we see Inspector Gadget is able to trace that and notice the SNI packet uh, in real time. Um, thank you. So if you're interested by uh, this project, you can look at the repository, of course. That's an open source project. And uh, we have um, some minutes for questions. Um, so a special thanks to Isvan for driving uh, this and helping uh, with the presentation as well, who is not here today.